Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are getting you set for the NFL Draft from a betting perspective with Danny Kelly of The Ringer. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng of ThePowerRank.com. Ed, it is draft season. I am psyched for that. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, I got out of jail this morning. Uh, it's been a kind of a <laughs> Wait, hectic. Uh, got out week. of jail? This is this. Is, I feel like we should be talking to HR for this, and not me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, two weeks ago, we talked about uh, kind of my COVID story. Uh, yeah. Went to Sloan, came back, uh, was sick, and tested negative for for the coronavirus. But then everyone I was in Boston, everyone that I was with in Boston, started testing positive. Um, and so, you know, it was, you know, we talked about this two weeks ago, like I really didn't know what was in my body, just given that, you know, my test was negative and everyone else I was with tested positive. Yeah. So fast forward to last week, you know, my wife was kind of sick and so she ended up testing positive. So the probability that I managed to catch a common cold in Boston, whereas everyone else I've been around the, you know, during a two week period, uh, had coronavirus, the odds of that seem pretty small, but when she ended up, uh, you know, testing positive last week, um, so you know, when you are, when you have it, you know, you're you're good to kind of go back to work like seven days after you start showing symptoms, and then three days after your last symptom. So, you know, she went to back to work the, this past Monday. She's a doctor, and you know, they obviously need her. Um, but and and if I, you know, I I most likely had it, and it, had I had it, I would have been able to be free to do whatever I want, you know? Um, but the rule is, you know, if you didn't have it and that's what the state of Michigan considers me as they, they say, I don't have it because my test was negative. Um, you need to be in your home for two weeks after your spouse first showed symptoms. So that was, uh, the end of two weeks was this morning. So wow. that's the sense in which I got out of jail. I've been, uh, you know, basically since her test came positive, uh, we've been in and around our house. We've been in our house. And uh, it's kind of nice to get out. It was a beautiful morning. That's Took the boys nuts. out. So How yeah. is everyone feeling? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I should preface everything. Yeah, the <laughs> family's fine. We're, okay. we're all happy. Uh, I, I mean, I haven't had an issue for, like, over two weeks now, right? Like, sure. You know, like um, – there was one pretty bad day the week I got back from Boston. Yeah. And ever since then, I've pretty much been fine. Huh. Um, so, uh, and my wife's doing fine. She's back at work, uh, has had a pretty good week. And my boys are fine as well. So, it's all kind of crazy. Um, this thing is very, very contagious. Yeah. I, I definitely have firsthand experience with that. So, be safe. Just assume that everyone that you are near has it and assume keep yourself. You have it. Yeah, what, what's that? I always assume that you have it too, so you're not giving yeah, it to other people. Yeah, assume you have it too, that you don't want to give it to anyone, uh, which is, you know, why we're keeping our social distance. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that, you know. That's you know. crazy. Well, I'm glad yeah. to hear that, like, your family is okay, because, like, yeah. that's, that, I mean, I know that, like, the odds of, like, death are low for, like, anyone yes. in, like, our age groups, but, like, it still sucks to, like, be sick. And so yeah. it's good to hear you know, that, like, you're feeling well. Yeah, no, no, everyone's feeling well. And it was actually interesting. My wife, when she got it, she's like, all right. She was actually pretty pumped about <laughs> it because she had, you know, she had gotten past, she had gotten past the sick part yeah. and, you know, you develop an immunity after you've had it. So um, she was happy that, you know, our family's been exposed to it. We're all fine. We have immunity to it now. And that's going to be an asset moving forward. So how did you like, like you couldn't leave the house at all for the two week period at all? Uh, we didn't leave our property. We did. We did like you can go. We went into our backyard, but we. I, I I didn't leave my property for seven days. So did you have like like groceries delivered? Like I'm yeah. like, cause like well, I I I have not. I we've been social distancing now for twenty days or whatever it is, and right. like I have not left for hardly anything. But like I am very low on my oatmeal and. Right. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. need to buy more oatmeal at some point. I'd rather not go to the grocery store, but like not having that flexibility to go to the grocery store, right. I feel like would be a pretty significant mental like weight. Yeah. I guess. No, it's definitely tough. 
Um, the fortunate thing is I have a lot of good friends around here. And so there was no shortage of people who offered to go buy stuff yeah. for the family. Uh, I picked my friend who is as anal about food as I am. And he did a great <laughs> job uh, getting exactly what I wanted so we could so we could get through this uh, little period. And then in terms of just kind of like the house arrest, you know, like I made up games like taking my sure. laundry one piece at a time to the basement. What? Um, to try to keep the body active. So... Yeah, it's it's been a crazy week, man. It was nice to get out this morning. I'm not yeah. not gonna lie about that. Well, I'm glad that everyone so is feeling well because, like, that's yeah. you know that's, yeah. that's the number one concern. Um, glad that that's out of the way, and now hey, you can move about freely once again. That's uh, well, just great for exercise. To hear. Otherwise, we're sheltering right. at home, right? Exactly. So. And like, I'm not going anywhere. I don't. Go, I didn't go anywhere that often to begin with. So like, it's not a major deviation for me anyway. But uh, glad to hear that you have that additional like freedom to like go for a run or whatever because right that's tough but i'm glad that it it, everything worked out okay or at least as, as okay as it could have for sure it yeah it's it's been relatively good so yeah. but it's been tough too well that is wild we're gonna talk about the nfl draft here in just a bit feels a bit trivial to talk <laughs> nfl draft game oh, and all the know. stuff that's that's going down but hey it's a distraction so you know. Yeah, I'm excited to talk NFL Draft, man. It's fun Absolutely. time. Absolutely. We're going to have Danny Kelly on. Uh, you can follow Danny on Twitter, at Danny B. Kelly. He is a staff writer for The Ringer. We are discussing his NFL Draft Guide and some prop bets that he likes uh, for this month's draft over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And a lot of good stuff there with Danny. Uh, he also has a full draft guide over at The Ringer. It has a mock draft. It has Danny's big board. It has uh, team needs from Robert Mays. So you can kind of see what needs teams may be addressing if you're like you can bet on who the jets will take first or the Giants take first etc and you can use those tools to help you bet uh ed are you a big draft guy yeah i mean i i enjoy uh the nfl draft a lot i think it's very interesting uh i do i, I have done some predictions in the past based on wisdom of crowds essentially like accumulating mock drafts uh mm -hmm. and in covering the future i'll talk about a resource for for you guys to get that information as well Okay, perfect. I like the draft has been like, it's always been one of my favorite days of the entire. I remember waking up the morning that Reggie Bush got drafted and I was like nervous because the Jets had kind of like a high end pick. And I was, right. I was, I was a, a, a very dumb child. So I was like, oh my gosh, I want the Jets to trade up to get Reggie Bush. Uh, cause like <laughs> I played with Reggie Bush on the NCAA football video game all the time. It was him and Matt right. Leinert, uh, like rest in peace to the NCAA video game. But like, I so desperately wanted to trade up that I was like nervous when I woke up. Um, so it's nice to like write about the draft from a betting perspective now because it's something I've been yeah. following for forever at this point. So uh, it'd be yeah, fun to talk to Danny. Yeah, for sure. I'm definitely excited about talking to Danny. Um, but just remember, Jim, we probably all thought like that back then, right? Before oh, yeah, we yeah, truly yeah. understood, you know, it's, you know, don't put yourself yeah. down over it. Man, I had a lot of now. Trying to take Saquon Barkley with the number two pick. Right. The Giants fan. We'll have a different we discussion. <laughs> Very different discussion. Yeah. Thankfully, I've learned. Um, I had a lot of bad takes. Like, I, the other guy I was mad the Jets missed out on was Tavon Austin. So, we're learning as we go along here and evolving uh, our thought process. Uh, a couple other podcasts we've had recently here with the Void in Sports. We talked with John Sheeran of FanDuel Sportsbook last week to cover the basics of betting on horse racing. Uh, FanDuel Racing is a thing. I actually, they had a free-to-play daily fantasy horse racing thing on FanDuel today, which I did. I have not looked to see if it went well. I have no idea if it went well. It could have been terrible. I played Daily Fantasy for the Challenge last night. So, you know, check out what John Sheeran said about horse racing. And also had Kevin Cole of Pro Football Focus on to outline the betting implications of NFL free agency two weeks ago as well. To get those podcasts, uh, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts uh, so you get these right as they are posted, especially in a time where... Things are a bit more sporadic, I guess, uh, given that there is no, no sports going on. So make sure you are subscribed to get these podcasts right as they are posted. And if you like what you hear... 
please leave us a rating and review as well because those, that, those do help us out a ton. Today's podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Racing. Speak of the devil, FanDuel is doing its part to continue to bring sports fans excitement by offering users the chance to bet on horse racing. Use your existing FanDuel DFS login credentials to gain access to tutorials to learn more about the sport, including understanding how the odds work, the various types of bets you can make, and most importantly, how to win those bets. Watch all the races live across over 300 tracks when things are operating normally, and fill the void left in your sports fandom today. For more details, visit racing.fanduel.com or download the Fanduel app today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Let's bring on Danny Kelly now to break down the NFL draft. Once again, Danny is on Twitter at Danny B. Kelly and check out his draft guide over at the ringer. Let's talk some NFL draft and pick Danny's brain to see where he thinks various players are going. Covering the present. Let's bring Danny Kelly into covering the spread to talk a little bit about the NFL draft. Danny, thank you. First of all, I know this is kind of a crazy time of year for you, even outside <laughs> yeah. of COVID-19. So how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Um, just, you know, trying to make the most of the situation and, and stay busy and all that. And, and so far, uh, staying very, very busy, you know, I... up to the draft. So. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, you did this last year, too. You know, you did the, the Ringer draft guide. Mm-hmm. I feel like this year is probably extra complicated given everything oh, yeah. that's going on. What's it been like for you? You know, trying to do, you know, this is like tax season, I guess, might be the best <laughs> analogy for you. Like, what's it been like having your yeah. tax season uh, <laughs> and when everything is kind of jumbled up like this? Oh, man. It's, well, first of all, I kind of play catch up because I, I typically start sort of scouting and getting really into the draft like November. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because I'm covering the NFL too during the regular season, so just kind of playing catch up. I, I thought I had a pretty good handle on it um, going into the Senior Bowl, going into the Combine, but you know, the last couple of weeks have been a challenge. Just you know, with staying home and and all the COVID related things, it's just kind of slowed everything down for me. But um, feeling good. I, I'm really really excited about the draft guide. Um, you know, it's about to go up to 85 players next week, and so and we'll have about uh, to 100 players by the time the draft rolls around. So. Um, feeling good about it. A lot of really, really exciting, fun players in this class. I cannot wait for the draft. I think it's just going to be, um, it's, it's hard to figure out whether I want the draft to happen or not, because it's obviously like a very strange time and and it almost feels inappropriate that it's happening or it it does feel inappropriate that it's happening. But at the same time, it's kind of a good, um, distraction for people that are, you know, obviously going through a lot of stress right now. So maybe, maybe it is a good thing. I don't know. I kind of land right in the middle there. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely feel like it's a good thing. I mean, they're not going to, they're not actually going to have like a real draft, right? Like they're going to do no. it all and yeah, it's going to be all over. I mean, as far as I know, it's like all video conference type stuff and, and right. work the phones and all that kind of thing. A lot of people actually, a lot of teams don't even go to the draft, to be honest. I think a lot of teams, you know, stay at their headquarters and, and do everything right. from there. I think it'll be a little different because you have to maintain social distancing still and everything, but um, right. I'm sure that there is the technology to kind of get it all done. So it's going to be a new challenge for teams, and that could kind of maybe change things a little bit. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how things play out because obviously, like, there are a lot of things that, like, we don't talk about a lot, you know, broadly about the draft, but things are changing uh, because yeah. of COVID-19. There are going to be fewer pro days, and that impacts a lot of guys with injury concerns, guys who maybe, maybe didn't work out due to right. resting in some instances uh, from the <laughs> combine. So yeah. that changes a lot of things. Obviously, teagan has got his pro day in, but... Is that going to increase the volatility in trying to predict the draft, knowing that teams have less data to work with and you maybe have like fewer people who are in the know just because yeah. there's there's less stuff going around? Does that change stuff for you trying to predict the draft too? I think it does. Maybe not so much in the first like 10 or 15 picks or so. You know, those seem to be like, you know, the blue chip guys are more or less locked in. You know, it just kind of depends who which team takes them. But um, when you start getting into the second half of the first round and, and into the second and third rounds, I think then it it makes a ton of volatility because, um, you know, you've got guys like, for instance, Brian Edwards, who didn't he didn't play at the senior bowl. He was unable to work out at the combine. Um, you know, he suffered a broken foot, I believe. And so like a lot of things hinged. A lot of his draft stock, I think, was a little bit contingent on him testing and showing to teams that he was fast enough, things like that. And now he could drop into potentially the fourth or fifth round, which I think is a, is going to be a steal for some team that gra- grabs him that late. But that's just one example of a lot of players who, like you said, kind of had to skip the the pre-draft stuff, the combine, 
and we're hoping and banking on a, a having a pro day to s- sort of you know boost their stock going into the draft. So um, I think it hurts those players a little bit more than normal, just just based on like you said, the people, teams just don't have as much info. Yeah, absolutely. So Danny, uh, really excited to ask you about some quarterbacks. We uh, yeah. have all just said that Joe Burrow is going number one, which seems like a lock, but a lot of interesting mm-hmm. things behind him. Uh, your mock draft has Dolphins taking Justin Herbert. Uh, and then with Tua Tagovailoa slipping down to the Chargers at the next pick, uh, is that is that how you see things playing out, or could there tra- could there be trades, or what's what's your take on the quarterback situation? I think so. Right now, my that 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 mock draft doesn't necessarily reflect what I think is going to happen now. I think okay. my biggest, um, and, and just full disclosure, like I don't do trades on my mock draft, so I kind of did it this way because I think that the Chargers are going to trade up to to get Tua. So I think the Dolphins will probably, if that happens, I think the Dolphins end up with Herbert and the Chargers end up with Tua. So that was kind of how I did that. I don't necessarily think Tua is going to go and fall behind Herbert necessarily, though I think it is in the realm of possibility. Um, But I think right now, kind of if I had to make a bet about it, I think either the Chargers or the Dolphins are going to trade up to that number three spot with the Lions and take Tua. And I, I think that's kind of... To me, and I was looking at some of the the odds and, and everything for the first three picks, and I and I just think it's going to be um, Burrow, Young, Tua, like, I, and, and that's the favorite right now. And I just feel like anything else is just like wildly <laughs> far less likely, I guess. Yeah. And you see the Chargers being the team that will make that move to go up to number three. I think that's kind of the the right now the winds are, are sort of saying that. The, there's whispers of that. There's a lot of rumors that they really really like Tua a lot. And I heard Dan Jeremiah talking about this the other day, um, maybe a couple of weeks ago, how the Dolphins don't necessarily have a huge, huge tilt or favorite in, in terms of Herbert or two. I think maybe they're, they're, they'd be happy to get either of those guys. And so maybe they're less likely to give up massive, massive, mm-hmm. you know, draft capital. You, even, a, in a, even a two or three spot move up, you're going to have to give up probably a first round pick. So, Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just don't know if they're you know necessarily willing to take that risk with with Tua's injury history. And obviously, we heard yesterday he came out and said he could play today, which is kind of insane to think about. I mean, <laughs> it's it's we a lot of people were thinking he might have like a like a red shirt season this yeah. whole year. And so maybe you know, and of course we can't confirm. <laughs> right, we can't confirm yeah. anything. But um, but yeah, so I, I think. That's just kind of where I'm leaning right now, but I think the Dolphins or the Chargers are the heavy, heavy favorites to land to a, and I'm leaning the Chargers on this one. Hey, Danny, I wanted to also ask you, what if Tua never hurt his hip? Yeah. How would that change things right now? <laughs> That's so hard. That's really, really hard to to kind of guess, I get think, because I remember talking to my editor, Ben Glixman, who is a huge, huge Tua guy, like halfway through the season before he got before Tua got hurt. And we were debating the Burrow Tua thing. And I was just right. like, I, I was on the Tua side. I was like, I think Tua is the best quarterback in this draft. Yeah. And then he got hurt. But also, Burrow finished off the season yeah. on an absolute tear. And he, I mean, he, he didn't, I wouldn't say he changed my mind, but he, I think that was enough for me to be like, okay, he's the guy. Like, I think he's the best quarterback in this class. He has the highest ceiling. He, the, the things he did in clutch time, um, some of the throws he made his athletic ability, just kind of the whole package. But especially to me like that, you know, it's always stupid to, to compare someone to Tom Brady, but like almost like that Tom Brady's like personality where it was just ice in his veins. Yeah. That to me was probably the most impressive thing. And, and I, Tua has that too. But I mean, just what, what Burrow did in the second half of the season and, and down the stretch and the playoffs and all that, I was just like, okay, yeah, he cemented it. He cemented it for me, but I think it's a very close – I think two is a very close number two, and I wouldn't be surprising if both of them are very good pros. Yeah, the fun thing for me about Burrow is that 33% of his games were against teams in the top seven in defensive SP+, yeah. plus, <laughs> which Isn't is that... just like, it's yeah. nuts. He tore, up, he tore up like really good yeah. defenses in, <laughs> yep. in like the <laughs> highest pressure situations imaginable in a college football environment. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So he, he was just, yeah, that was in, highly, highly impressive to me. So let's talk about the other quarterbacks in this class. Uh, beyond Herbert, Tunga Vailoa, and Burrow, we got Jordan Love, uh, who mm-hmm. is predictably polarizing. He is like this year's like Daniel Jones or Josh Allen, where you're kind of in or you're out. Uh, his draft prop right now at FanDuel Sportsbook is 17.5 with minus 112 on the over and the under. 
based on what you've been seeing with Love and what you've heard about him, do you think that he goes within the first 17 picks or is he dropping outside of that uh, in the back half of the first round? Uh, this is a this is a very very tough one. My in, like my gut says he's a top he's going to be a top 10 pick. Like hmm. just based on the way that the NFL works, just the yeah. way that historically yeah. teams have been so so aggressive and going to get their guy. I did not think Josh Allen and Daniel Jones were going to be top 10 picks. It's just the way the NFL operates. And I will say the one thing that makes me a little bit hesitant to say that, because normally I think in a normal season, I'd be very, very like, oh, he's a top 10 pick for sure. Someone's going to trade up. But this year with the sort of glut of, of available quarterbacks on the free agent market, like mm -hmm. uh, James Winston's still out there, you know, like Cam Newton's still out there. Maybe that has enough of an impact where teams are like, OK, we don't absolutely have to go up and get a guy. Um, but I still, you know, and, and I think Jordan Love, like, very, very intriguing skill set, very, very high, high upside. But, you know, he, he seems to me more like a late first round type player. But I thought that about Dan Jones, too. So I don't even know. I, I'm If I'm making that bet, I'm going, I'm going the, I guess, would it be the over? Whatever it is. Okay. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the, I think he'll go in the top 10. So whatever. Yeah. The, yeah. So that's the over. Okay. Okay, so we're going that way with Jordan Love. What about you as like an evaluator? You said late first. Is that yeah. a situation where like if you were an NFL team, you'd be looking to trade back into the latter half of the first round to get that fifth year option? Is that the the, the area yeah. where you see Jordan Love? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I you know I think again, like I said, he's got really high upside, but at the same time, you know, you look at his decision making. You look at uh, to me, he had a little bit of inconsistency in his accuracy downfield. His decision making was pretty questionable, and so. Um, on one hand, you know, like I, I can see like how teams could fall in love with the skill set. And I think it is a factor that he was playing, you know, where he had to, he felt that he needed to elevate the guys around him. It, you know, he's not very much talent around him. So he, he felt like he had to play a little bit of hero ball. I think there's definitely that aspect of it. But to me, I still wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable <laughs> taking him in the top 10 if I was a GM just because um, just because of all those question marks. And I think there's just so much variability. Like you, there's a lot of variability with any quarterback and, and there's a lot of risk with any quarterback, but I'm not sure I'd be able to be comfortable with that or not. Awesome. So Danny, the next quarterback uh, being considered is Jalen Hurts. Uh, he's gotten a lot of buzz lately. Uh, his prop is at 69 and a half. Seems like he's having a late surge. I've yeah. been particularly interested in Hurts because it looked like Lincoln Riley went away from his throwing abilities late in the year. Uh, mm -hmm. He had a lot more quarterback runs that he was calling when the competition got tough in the Big 12. Would love to know your take on Jalen Hurts. I like Hurts a lot, actually. I think, um, I think, like you said, there's certainly question marks about his ability to throw. He was a little bit too reticent to leave the pocket at the face of pressure, you know, that kind of thing. But I do think that... Um, he showed enough improvement in accuracy and all that, all the important like metrics in terms of passing this last year that teams will be very, very intrigued by that improvement and think that he can continue to improve because, and I actually compare him to Dak Prescott in, in, a, in a way, because if you look at it, like some of the scouting reports for Prescott coming out of college, it was very, very similar to what hurts is it's kind of like crumbles under pressure um, hit and miss accuracy, tries to, you know, escape pressure too early. Is he a pocket passer? All those things like you, it's like you're reading a Jalen Hurts scouting report. So, um, you know, obviously Dak came in and he continued to improve in his accuracy. And, and that's sort of, I think what teams are going to be betting on. I do think he's got a pretty good shot of being like, like what we we're talking about with Jordan Love. It, mm -hmm. The team's going to trade back up into the first round and take him. seems like he's getting that buzz. And and not that Daniel Jeremiah is, Jer Jeremiah is the end-all, be-all in terms of the buzz, but he just put him in his top 50. And I okay. think that is sort of signifying, you know, the direction this is going. I would definitely hammer um, him being higher picked than 69. I, I don't know. I just think, like, someone's going to take a chance on him. And if it's either in the late first or somewhere in the second round, that's not a reach at all for me. So I think he's going to go higher than that. And that number was at 75, so it's been coming down already, yeah. but it sounds like could come down even more. And I think that your discussion about that at the back end of the first round is interesting because right now, if you look at FanDuel Sportsbook, the total on the quarterbacks in the first round is four and a half. It's plus 330 on the over. That's pretty good juice. And mm. it's not just Jalen Hurts. Uh, you were talking about this uh, today on the Ringer NFL show, how like Hurts could be there. Maybe Jacob Eason is a guy people trade up in the back half of the first round to get. Yeah. 
Is there a big enough chance that one of these guys sneaks into the back end of the first round where you would be willing to bet the over at four and a half? I think I would. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a good enough, like you said, it's, it's good enough payout or whatever for yeah. to take that choice because I think, um, like Easton's a great example. Like someone is going to fall in love with his arm talent, and even though he struggles, you know, it, it, with decision making, face the pressure, all that thing, like. He's got like a Stafford arm, like it's it's legitimately impressive. And so, um, if you if you find a team that can think they can turn him into like sort of in the role that I like, I imagine him in like a Tannehill role where he's doing a lot of play action and stuff like that. Someone I think could fall in love with that for sure. Um, so it would not surprise me if if it if they did hit the over, like just because like Hertz, Love, Burrow, Eason, uh, sorry. Um, Herbert. I mean, there's just yeah. like it's just going to be. I think it, there there's going to be a run on quarterbacks, and and you just never can really guess. But I would not be surprised at all if that was the if that was the case. Excellent. So let's go over the receiver position. Uh, Jerry mm-hmm. Judy at minus one twenty five is the favorite to be the first wide receiver off the board. Um, but a lot of other good prospects and CD Lamb and and Henry Ruggs. Yeah. Uh, would you ride Judy here, or uh, do you like a little bit of long? shots with uh lamb or rugs i think i would go with lamb i mean i i I do think that judy has a solid solid chance to be like one you know the first receiver but i I don't know like there's i think there's certainly teams that have lamb rated higher um i have lamb rated slightly higher and i just think they're very different stylistically like lamb is sort of an outside guy a go up and get it guy really, really strong after the catch. Judy is more of a technician as a route runner. He's very explosive in the short area and all that. And he's primarily played in the slot last season. So maybe that has maybe that's a factor enough for some team to be like, okay, we would rather go get DeAndre Hopkins than, um, you know, like a whatever right. you want to compare Judy to. I guess a lot of people have different comps to him. But, um, yeah, I just <clears> – <throat> I think there's a good enough chance. I would take a, I would take a swing on Lamb, honestly. And and the, the Ruggs one is, is – pretty interesting as well because yeah. someone like it's like the Easton thing someone's gonna fall in love with his speed man and mm. it wouldn't be a shock to me at all if someone took rugs first just because they think he can change the dynamic of their offense so much yeah, yeah CD Lamb is really fun just because like he's basically he kind of looks like saquon barkley after the catch which is like disgusting to think about uh, yeah. just and like you ran a 4 or 5 at the combine and people like talk that up as like a negative but it's like that's, I wouldn't like yeah. yeah, if I had made like a betting line on CD Lamb, it would have been higher than four point five oh, like yeah. even like yeah. four five five or something. So <laughs> I think that helped him quite a bit. And I think at plus one fifty five, he's he's pretty interesting too. I think I'm I'm yeah. down with that one as well. Let's talk about the running backs here. Uh, DeAndre Swift is a favorite. He's minus 175 to be the first running back taking, uh, taken. Jonathan Taylor, uh, a Twitter favorite. He's plus 155. J.K. Dobbins, 8-1. to one. Mm. Who stands out to you most among that group? <laughs> Taylor, for sure. I just okay. think um, it is, it is, it's actually pretty fascinating to me that Swift is still the favorite with the odds um, to be the first one taken because it feels like the fantasy community. Yeah by far favors Taylor just based on his analytics, his size, um, things like that. But um, I would say I would probably hammer Taylor just because he's a foundation type back. And I think for a team that wants to invest this heavy of a draft or this, this high of a draft pick on a running back, they're probably going to want a guy like Taylor who is more of a foundation back than I think Swift is. I think Swift is, you know, he's never had um, like a bell cow type, workload in college i think he's got like only like a few games where he's had more than 20 carries so i don't know if a team is willing to sink a first round pick into that it'll be interesting i think it's gonna be one of the more interesting yeah. storylines to follow to me um because i think you know both taylor and swift are very very talented but i would i would put my money on taylor i, I think dobbins is probably not a not a great great bet honestly um you know obviously good odds but I think he's probably more of like a late second rounder, to be honest. So um, I would I would probably put my money on Taylor in this situation just because I think his skill set is the type of thing that teams will sink a, a high pick into. Yeah, I, I mean, I personally love Jonathan Taylor as well. Like, I think he's got quicker feet than Saquon mm-hmm. Barkley, and I think he actually might be faster. I know he's got like some track yeah. credentials. Yeah, I think he's gross. Yeah. yeah. 
There's so, he, yeah, there's I think there's only like a few runners that are his size that have gotten under four four in the last like decade. It's it, he he's truly a very special athlete, and so I think someone's gonna definitely kind of look at that and, and think that he can be a difference maker enough to to be worth that high of a pick. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and it to me it kind of boggles the mind that Saquon Barkley was kind of drilled in as the second pick. Maybe that was just because the Giants had that pick. <laughs> Whereas I actually really like Taylor Moore, having seen a lot of his games, and you know he's not anywhere near that category. Yeah, he near is that fast, lot, which is probably fine because he's a running back. But talent wise, you know, I think it's all there. I don't. Yeah, because someone asked me that recently. Like, why is Taylor not? a top 10 like a consensus top 10 pick and i'm like my first instinct was like oh teams have learned from their mistakes right. but i'm actually not sure that's the case right. did they ever <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean i think they certainly we saw with uh, what happened with like melvin gordon um he didn't get a huge contract like he wanted and and todd Gurley got released like all these bad second contracts for running backs are maybe the nfl is starting to finally realize <laughs> But again, the Cowboys just got done giving one to Ezekiel right. Elliott, so I don't, you know, I don't know. It's right. just team to team, so um, yeah. who knows? But that's just kind of, um, I get, I, I, I guess I can't answer that. I don't know why <laughs> he's not like a considered a top ten pick because they they are similar type um, type prospects. I, I guess maybe the the lack of pass catching maybe holding him back a little bit. Yeah, that didn't come in until he was a junior, and that yeah. seemed like it was a forced thing. But, like, when they did throw it to him, he was really good. So, I, yeah. I guess, like, I wouldn't view that as being, like, a negative for him. Maybe just a organizational Neutral. misfire by Wisconsin initially, potentially. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah. Uh, any other props that seem advantageous for you, Danny, as things stand right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook? So, I was – this This is an interesting one. I was looking at the Jets' first pick yeah. prop, and I noticed that Tristan Wirfs was uh, – 700 or plus seven or seven to one. I think there's a solid chance that he could be their pick. So I think that's pretty same with Beckton. Actually, he's the same odds. Yeah. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't bet one of those just on the off chance. They fall in love with one of those guys. Both guys could potentially play left tackle. Beckton was a left tackle throughout his career. Um, so, you know, obviously they did sign George Fant. And so maybe that's enough for them to not take one. I still think they need to take a tackle. Does that pain that you to point. say that as a, as a Seahawks fan, to, <laughs> that George Fant may answer their left tackle issues? <laughs> yeah. I mean, back in, I, I can't even remember, 2017 or something, we were pretty excited about him being the left tackle, and then he tore his ACL yeah. in the preseason, and then he was basically just like a sixth lineman slash big tight, tight end, end for them yeah. for the last <laughs> couple seasons. And so right. I'm guessing they, they don't see him as the answer, although he did, he did get a pretty big contract. Um, but maybe that's just maybe that's just a hedge for what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, and it has know. like a, a one year out too. Uh, so I think right. that that you know that makes sense too. And the thing with Worfs is that Joe Douglas coming from Philadelphia, and last year they took Andre Dillard, traded up for Andre Dillard in the first round. Andre Dillard was like this once you adjust your weight, this combine freak. Who was the biggest freak at the combine this year? It was Tristan Worfs. So I think. Yeah. If he were to be available, I feel like he would be kind of a no-brainer. And I think for 7-1, to one, I, I'm on board with that for sure. Yeah, that one stood out to me. Um, I think a lot of people obviously think they're going to take a receiver. But, I mean, it, it, what what impacts Sam Darnold more, do you think? Like having a top-tier receiver or having time to throw? I don't know. It'll be right. interesting to see what they decide. But I would probably lean OT. Yeah, I mean, I would too, especially with like – with Sam Darnold's Jameis Winston-like tendencies, I would try to lower the number of times he's put in weird situations. And the best yeah. way to do that is right. by giving him a better offensive line. Just, there's way too much Jameis in Sam Darnold, so I would want to just minimize the Jameis that can come out that, by that is, giving him a good is, old line. That's an amazing point, actually. I, I love just that. So now Minimize the Jameis at all times. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, that is Danny Kelly of The Ringer. Make sure you check out his NFL Draft Guide. Uh, just search for uh, The Ringer NFL Draft Guide and check out. It's got a mock draft. It has uh, Danny's big board. It's got team needs from Robert Mays as well. Check all that out at The Ringer. Danny, really appreciate the time for today. Stay safe and stay healthy, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Enjoy your draft prep. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Covering the future. One final big thank you to Danny Kelly for swinging by. Make sure you give him a follow on Twitter at Danny B. Kelly. And Ed, the thing that I love about, about, about Danny's draft guide is that he has like comps for each player, but like usually it's just right. like the player. Uh, but like 
he has like interesting ways to phrase it. Like uh, Jordan loves comp is a YOLO Marcus Mariota. And like, I think that these are all, these are really fun, uh, but it was fun yeah. to kind of dig through that and see what his thoughts were on every player that uh, uh, will be going near the top end of the draft. Yeah, absolutely. And the write up write ups are, uh, you know, pretty in depth. I mean, he's clearly watched uh, the tape and uh, yeah, it's just a good, really good way of getting caught up. Like the ringer, uh, draft guide is, is pretty good because you can kind of interact with it on yeah. many different levels. Um, well beyond just having a mock draft, uh, you can look at, you know, the scouting reports and, and that's where it's super interesting. Yeah. And, uh, we were talking a little bit about Tua and yeah. like, I wish we could do a whole podcast on Tua. Cause like, <laughs> yeah, like Joe Burrow has fun stats we can state, but like Tua right. has some too. And like, I could spend a whole podcast talking about those two guys yeah. exclusively. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing I, I've I've loved Tua ever since he came in in the second half of that that national yeah. championship. I mean, he definitely played like a freshman in that half of football, but you could see the accuracy, obviously, on the last touchdown that won the game for them over Georgia. Um, and he's just, you know, he's just he has played like he's very accurate, he reads defenses really well, and those are really the first two things that I think you would want to look at in an NFL quarterback. Um, and, you know, with Joe Burrow, it's just – it's just he was awesome last year. No one is debating that. Uh, but it's just really a small sample size, right? Yeah. And and that's always – until he is a consistently good pro, um, there's always going to kind of be that that knock on him. Um, another, you know, interesting thing I was looking at Danny's uh, draft guy. You know, he's got Jeffrey Okuda as the number four pick, the cornerback out of uh, Ohio State. And he's got a really interesting story, too, because he didn't start two years ago. He obviously had a great season this year, uh, has the physical traits to, to you know, be a shutdown cornerback. But, you know, they pretty much had the same dudes in this, playing cornerback at Ohio State uh, this year and, and the past year. Uh, Kendall Sheffield did end up leaving Ohio State after the 2018 season, uh, was, a, was a late draft pick and, and ended up playing a lot of snaps with the, with the Falcons this year. But Okuda wasn't actually the starter. Uh, in 2018. So I find that interesting as well, just because we know from what PFF has done that, you know, coverage grades tend to be pretty random from year to year. So, um, you know, was there some randomness that helped, uh, you know, Okuda's grade and, and what we're watching and, and could that potentially slip? I don't know. But another thing I found really interesting uh, in some of Danny's work. Yeah, for sure. And it's good to t- keep that context in mind always uh, with the draft. Um, I want to quiz you quick. Just because we're talking cool. about Tua. Um, if you had to guess what Tua Tunga Vailoa's adjusted yards per attempt was on third and six or longer this year. Now, that's a, that's a down where the defense knows a pass is coming. It's probably right. going to lead to more, more interceptions, more inaccurate throws. The average AYA for like a, a first round pick is probably around like 8.7 or so. If you had to guess Tua's AYA on third and six or longer this year, where would you put it? I mean, are we taking out sacks? Yes, I'm going to take out sacks because A N Y A accounts for sacks. A Y A does not account for sacks. But two had okay. the second lowest sack rate among all quarterbacks, or among right. the top end quarterbacks this year. Jake Fromm was actually number one, despite being a pretty bad athlete. I don't know. I presume it's good. I presume it's over 10. It is a little bit over 10. It is 17.8. <laughs> what? 17.8 adjusted wow. yards per attempt. It was 15. Point, I think eight for his entire career. So wow. even when they knew the pass was coming, Tua was slinging it and slinging it yeah. well. So I really want yeah. to be healthy because like he's so fun. That's that's yeah. all I ask for is a healthy Tua. Let's move now to covering the future. And Ed, you're going to talk about uh, the NFL draft. I actually am too. Um, and talk about some resources we can use when trying to bet the NFL draft. What did you find uh, when you were trying to find some stuff around that? Yeah, so so I talked a little bit about wisdom of crowds. It's actually one of the predictors that I use for many aspects of the work I do. Um, so the idea is, uh, basically the idea for the draft is you want to combine a bunch of mock drafts, right? So one mock draft isn't going to be perfect, but when you combine 60 or even more of them together, you get a pretty good estimate for you know who is going to go where. And it's the same idea with the preseason college football polls, right? None, none of those single ballots are perfect, but when you combine 60 of them together, you get a very strong predictor for bowl performance, really. Um, the idea is that you know these sports writers get together and, and they can assess team strength uh, really well for the preseason AP poll. 
So for the for the NFL draft, it's it's not much different. Uh, I've done some work on it in the past. I found it to be a pretty strong predictor. Uh, ben Ro- Benjamin Robinson has kind of taken over a lot of that uh, work. So you can find his work at grindingthemocks.com. And he's got a whole, a whole bunch of resources. He's been collecting like hundreds of NFL mock drafts and using those pr- to predict where uh, – Various players are going to go, um, you know, and it, it all makes kind of some common sense with Joe Burrow going first and Chase Young second and all that. Um, definitely a resource that I would use. Uh, for example, I went and looked at uh, players from certain teams and compared them to the markets, and they were all pretty consistent uh, conferences as well. So I wasn't able to find any value, uh, when I was looking, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it as a resource to potentially find value with, with some of the bets. Again, it's all about this wisdom of the crowds in which one particular mock draft isn't going to be perfect, but when you combine enough of them together, you can get a pretty powerful predictor for what is going to happen on April, uh, 20, 20, whatever the first round is. I think so. Uh, and it's also important to kind of project like, you know, obviously mock drafts that are coming in later are going to do a little bit better with more information coming in as well. Um, so keep that in mind as well when you look at it. But uh, it can be a great resource. I know in past years, Arif Hassan of The Athletic has done a consensus big board, which yep. is kind of the same thing, except it's not mocks. It's like big boards, which is straight up rankings as opposed to where they'll go in the draft. And I'd also recommend sure. that because it can kind of help illustrate where the mocks may potentially be a little bit wrong. Um, so I don't know if he's doing it this sure. year. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but Arif Hassan, I believe it's Arif Hassan NFL on Twitter, uh, has done that as well. So lots of good resources out there to check out if you're looking for consent, you know, wisdom of the crowds, like Ed was saying. Now for mine, I have been digging into research around offensive line because I've had this data on my computer about uh, – offensive linemen at the at the combine and adjusting for weight and trying to figure out what it means and finally i have something i can use it for which is it delights me i can bet on the draft using all this data so i looked at data uh, at combines from 2010 on separating players out between tackles and interior offensive linemen and linemen can be makai beckton who's like 364 or something like that they can be guys who are closer to 300 so it's important to adjust all workouts for weight. And once you have the weight adjusted numbers, I compare them to see where players were drafted each year. And there actually was a, a decently strong relationship uh, between some metrics and where players got drafted. If we look at tackles specifically, the weight adjusted workout with the closest correlation to draft position was actually the 40 yard dash, which may be surprising, uh, mm-hmm. but that was the, right. at least from a draft stock perspective. The shuttle was second best, uh, followed by the three cone. And that means that we can at least to an extent, use these numbers when betting on where various tackles may go in the draft, which is interesting because this year we had two like historic performances in the 40-yard dash for tackles. Those are from Tristan Wirfs and Mackay Becton, and Wirfs had the fifth best weight-adjusted 40 among tackles at the Combine since 2010. The only guys ahead of him are... Basically, three of them are all pros. Uh, Taron Armstead, Bruce Campbell didn't really work out. Uh, Lane Johnson and Trent Williams. Two of those guys went within the top four picks. Uh, Lane Johnson and Trent Williams, both the fourth overall pick. Worfs could be that this year. Becton was the eighth best weight adjusted 40-yard dash time. But Worfs also had really good numbers in the three cone and the shuttle, while Becton did not compete in those workouts. So, Based on combine numbers, I think we should be pretty high on where Tristan Wirfs and where he'll go in the draft. If you look at FanDuel Sportsbook, he is currently the favorite to be the first lineman off the board at FanDuel Sportsbook. He's plus 125. Becton is plus 190. Jedrick Wills is plus 290. And this number has moved. Um, I think Wirfs is okay at plus 125, but he was actually plus 160 a couple weeks ago when I, I wrote about this for number fire. So, would have preferred him there, and I think that where they're at right now, Jedrick Wills is actually pretty interesting at plus 290. But from a Wirfs perspective, my favorite market is Wirfs draft position under 8.5. Uh, it's minus 152, which is an implied probability of 60.3%, and I can be pretty okay with that. Uh, we have both the Giants and the Cardinals picking within the first eight picks to hit the under here, and they're in the market for a tackle. If the Chargers of the Dolphins were to decide to pass up on a quarterback, they would also be in the discussion, but that seems less likely. So I'm going to focus on just the Giants and the Cardinals. 
But there are also a couple of teams, you know, with the Jets and the Browns specifically that could look to leapfrog the Cardinals in order to draft the tackle of their preference. So I think there are at least two tackle needy teams in the top eight picks, and there could potentially be a third if either the Browns or the Jets were to move up to, let's say, seven with Carolina trading down, given that they have a very analytics-friendly front office now, would not be shocked if they were to move down and potentially allow the Browns or the Jets to get a tackle at seven. So we could have as many as three tackle needy teams under eight and a half here. So I like worse, minus eight and a half, minus one, or under eight and a half, minus 152. But broadly, I think that his workout metrics say we should be into him from a betting perspective. Tristan Wirfs, an Iowa guy. Uh, it's kind of fun to look at all these Big Ten players and see where they're going to go. And the Big Ten dudes, like, for whatever reason, they've had, like, these, like, insane combine numbers. Like, you mm-hmm. remember all, like, the, the the Penn State guys that one year? I think it was the, the Barkley year, who were just, like, putting down, like, these disgusting numbers, like, across the board? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Some, some of their linemen. Yeah. Like, and uh, Mike Gesicki, the tight end, also had, like, historic numbers so right. i'm excited I, I like having a use for this offensive line data because i've had it on my sure. computer for a couple years now i'm like hey i actually have a reason to use it it's great yeah uh over at grinding the mocks uh he does have tristan Wirfs at at seventh so okay there we go It'd be consistent with your under eight and a half so uh always good to put two different things together and if yeah. they agree i will happily take that act on. absolutely all right quarantine corner for this weekend uh, what has yeah. the Feng House been doing while essentially under house arrest for the past couple of weeks? <laughs> well, I've been reading a lot, but I actually wanted to talk about some of my favorite comedy specials okay. uh, because uh, you can get these all on Netflix. I love comedy specials. Uh, that is probably the majority of what I watch on Netflix. So let's just get right into it, man. Ricky Gervais, uh, Humanity is just drop dead hilarious. Uh, he's amazing. Um. Uh, and then also uh, Neil Brennan, he is famous because he co-wrote Chappelle Show uh, oh. with Dave Chappelle back then. Um, before that, obviously went defunct. He's got a special called Three Mics, where he has three different mics. So one is straight up stand up, uh, another one is one liners, and the third one is quote unquote serious stuff. And it is not just hilarious. It, I mean, it's just the, his stand up comedy is. Awesome. And he's actually got a great bit about football and football players in it. But some of the serious stuff, like not exactly what you expect in a comedy special, will just blow your mind. Um, So Neil Brennan and Three Mics is awesome as well. And then the best comedy special that I've ever seen is Dave Chappelle, Equanimity. He had a number of Netflix specials uh, coming out, um, you know, when he was kind of coming back into the comedy world. Equanimity is the best You'll know it because uh, kind of the punchline is, and then I kicked her in between the legs, <laughs> except he didn't say between the legs. Yes. Uh, so he uses that punchline throughout the whole thing. And the reason I love that one so much is because he just, he's so brilliant and in the ways he like brings race uh, into his comedy and just makes pretty profound statements about race relations in this country while making you die laughing as well. So equanimity uh, by Dave Chappelle. And then, I mean, I got to, just because I don't only love male comics as well, uh, talk about Ali Wong. She is so funny. And not just because she makes fun of cheap Chinese people, which I would know a little (laughs) bit something about. um, But but Baby Cobra is awesome. Um, She's done two specials, uh, both when she's about seven months pregnant. And they are both definitely worth checking out. Baby Cobra is the first one, and I think that one is slightly better. Um, But she is amazing. And, um, yeah, also, uh, she's got a movie called... uh, Always uh, Be My Maybe, yes. Always, Yeah, there you go. I watched that, like, the week it came out. Because we had watched the standard specials, too. And so, like, when we knew that she had a movie coming out, we watched it right away, and it was awesome. I think, okay, this is my... I don't know if it's a hot take. My semi-hot take is that she's almost better as an actress than she is a stand-up, and I really like her stand-up. So, right. like, that's a, a pretty major compliment. But, like, I like her a lot in both. I think she might have something else in the works. Uh, she was in a couple episodes of Big Mouth, if you've heard of that. Uh, but, like, okay. she's really good in both. So I would yeah. also back up Ali Wong, too. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think she's a good actress. I think the writing in Homos Be My Maybe 
It's like some of the best writing I've seen in a comedy movie, like maybe ever. I, but I, Keanu I, Reeves, like yeah. cameo, is one of the like top five. Like the scene at dinner is like one of the top five like scenes I've seen in a movie in a while. Well, and then when he, and then when they go back later and he actually punches him, yeah, <laughs> and then writes a song about it. Anyways, we're we're giving away that's spoilers, man. Jim, yeah. Got, oh, yeah. You're right. Uh, you're right. You're right. Um, <laughs> Ali Wong is awesome. Highly endorse that one. I have watched most of John Mulaney's uh, stand-up specials more than yeah. one time. Um, John Mulaney's good too. And he's you also gotta... in Big Mouth, if you are aware of that. Uh, okay. But I like John Mulaney a lot. Michael Che had one uh, from SNL. It was pretty good. I like that one. I just like Michael Che like on SNL right. a lot. So watching him do a full Santa special is pretty enjoyable. Um, we saw Eliza Schlesinger at right. uh, one of the casinos in upstate New York over the fall. That was really good. And that special is now on Netflix. So you can watch that one. That's her most recent one, but she has like five, I think at this point, and she has a new sketch show that came out this week. Um, and then one we watched the first weekend of social distancing was Taylor Tomlinson. And she's like, good. yeah, couple years younger than my fiance and I, but like we're still close enough to that range where we can like understand a lot of what she's saying. So um, a lot of really good stand-up stuff out on Netflix. But um, I actually have not seen the first two you talked about, Neil Brennan and uh, Ricky Gervais. So I might need to check those out too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Ricky Gervais, that's the only one of his that's on Netflix, I believe. Okay. And then Neil Brennan, uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Neil Brennan's... Neil Brennan is just, I mean, he's so good. Yeah. Uh, if you need another laugh, if like you were into like Chappelle show and all that stuff, check out his toast to Dave Chappelle for the Mark Twain award. Oh my God. It's so good. I, yeah, it's just, just search it on YouTube. Okay. Like if, perfect. If, if you, if you like, you know, if Chappelle show and any of that stuff like rings a bell with you, yeah, check yeah. out his tribute to so Dave. If, if we're talking Netflix, I, I should probably watch you. If you watch this tiger King thing, that's been, that everyone seems to be talking yeah, about. I pulled I pulled up the preview uh, last night to see if it was something I could watch with my kids. I haven't seen any of them yet. I would not I, watch it with your kids. <laughs> like there I aren't hear. a lot of like, I guess there are bad words, uh, but like it's just more bad behavior, I guess, that I wouldn't like, right. necessarily want. Because like people like online debate various things about this thing and like they're like oh this person's the worst i'm like no they're actually all the worst like they're all hideous human beings as long as you accept that it's enjoyable but if like i think the comp i would make is if you did not like breaking bad i think one of the biggest turnoffs of breaking bad was that there was no one you could root for in that show and i think that's a very fair criticism of it you're not gonna like tiger king because like everyone is just terrible like they're all hideous human beings uh so it depends on what you're looking for i guess is the way that i'd phrase that yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm definitely interested in checking it out uh, amongst other things that I'm trying to do. So Yeah. Um, so for my quarantine corner, I'm actually going to stick with this same thing. Uh, but my fiance and I are huge fans of extremely trashy reality TV, like bottom of the <laughs> awesome. barrel type stuff. Uh, our favorite one is called Are You The One, which is it's not trash. It's it's wonderful. It's like if The Bachelor were multiplied by 20 because it's uh you're trying to find the perfect match uh for 10 or 11 different people so it's it's basically the the bachelor times 20 which is great but they've got one on netflix now called love is blind and yes it's pretty interesting um have you yeah. watched that uh no but my wife has i was no actually i did I, I i yeah i watched a little bit with her one time yeah it's like really you gotta explain interesting. The premise. yeah so basically the way it works is they put uh, a bunch of men and women in this compound and they are allowed to talk to each other behind walls. So they can't see each other. They can only talk. And they said they were talking for like eight hours one day to like these, like basically like you speed date for an hour and talk to people over the course of various days. And at the end you have to propose. And it made me like so weirded out to be like, you're proposing after eight days. And it's just like, it like was a weird, weird concept from that perspective. But like, If you are like me, someone who enjoys trashy reality TV where a lot of dumb stuff happens, it fills that void is the way that I'd phrase it. Um, So it's pretty interesting. I don't know. How much have you seen of it? Well, I don't know. I was I kind of 
like picked up on the premise and I was like, this is like inhumane, right? Kind of. It's like cruel yeah. and unusual punishment in some yeah. ways of like uh, kind of pushing people into relationships. So yeah. I told my wife, I was like, look, she she also likes bottom of the barrel oh, reality yeah. TV. And I was like, I've watched a lot of Kardashians with you, honey. So <laughs> I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'm going to play the card and not watch this with you. I think that you need to ask her if she's watched Are You the One, and if she has not, uh, get her into I, that. They have not been renewed. I don't think. Yeah, Are You the One? Okay. Um, if she hasn't gotten into it, I'd recommend it. There are I think eight seasons of content to catch up on. Like we tried yes. to catch up on Love Island, um, but like there are almost too many episodes. Like they have like thirty three right. episodes per season, and they're all good. But it's so right. hard to get through all of them. So I would check with your wife to see if she's watched Are You the One. And she has not. I would uh, nudge that up. Maybe we'll get fantasy around, you know, these uh, shows once they come back and stuff, too. Because there's fantasy, yeah. I think, Top Chef. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Uh, nice. Fantasy Survivor. I've not watched Survivor in probably 20 years. But, hey, you know. Right. Enjoy. Hey, it's a, a weird time. We need stuff to bet on. Exactly. Uh, I was watching Jonathan Bales do push-ups before yeah. we jumped on this call. <laughs> did you did you bet? Did you get in on the action or no? I did not get in on okay. the action. I still think I would take he's he's more than halfway done with Yeah. Number more than half his time left, but still it's so, going to hurt. I worked with Bales uh like he was like kind of my boss when I did stuff for Roto Academy rest in peace. Um and I know how like motivated he is as an individual and i feel like right. even if he could not physically do the push-ups he would still do them so i did not get on the action either just because like by the time i saw it the juice on yes he would make it was like minus 125 because like it had gotten bet pretty hard um i i didn't want to go in at that point but he's a yeah he is a deranged individual i mean that in a very positive sense um so <laughs> hey if you're bored check out their periscope no. <laughs> No, B Bales is awesome, man. I mean, yeah. a lot of the uh, the fantasy books that he's written are definitely worth checking out. And then a lot of the things on his site are really awesome as well. I remember kind of getting engaged with some of the, uh, just looking at his bookshelf. And yeah. uh, he's written a big article about 40 things he's learned as an entrepreneur. Um, definitely some great stuff over there. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I will not be following suit. There will be no push-ups out of me uh, anytime <laughs> soon. That is all that we have well, for today here. Oh, go ahead. What you got? Oh, this is it. I just love the theater of it, right? Like, oh, yeah. They pick this time to do it. They're making a huge thing about it, you know, with Twitch. And, like, it's actually pretty interesting, you know? Like, it I is. watched it a little bit. It makes me think whether I want to have, like, you know, some running challenge at the Michigan track. Just to... Yeah. There'll be no one there. <laughs> There'll be no one there. And you're free so, to go hey, out now. So, hey, you're good. I'm free to go exercise. I would not even be breaking the shelter in place. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I think the biggest surprise of that the Bales push up challenge is that Adam Levitan is there, and he is like he he has a solo podcast, and he talks often about how big of a germaphobe he is. So him leaving the apartment or house in a pandemic that shows you how big this is. So uh, <laughs> high stakes for the Jonathan Bales push up challenge. That is all that we have for today. Big final thank you once again to Danny Kelly. Check him out on Twitter at Danny B Kelly and check out the Ringer NFL Draft Guide as well. Make sure you check out all the covering the spreads we've done here recently by searching for covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. Ed, where can people find you on Twitter and your work as well? Yeah, I'm at the Power Rank. Uh, check out my stuff at thepowerrank.com. And then also the Football Analytics Show. I went uh, non-football for this last episode. I had Cliff Sargent on. He runs a YouTube channel called Better Than Food where he helps you find great books. And that's something that we could probably use right now with the with the lack of sports. So it was fun talking to him. I asked him in particular, like, what kind of books would you recommend for people who like football and, and yeah. data? And he did a really good job uh, with with a lot of things and, and, and put even more books on my list. Um, so football analytics show, check out my recent show with Cliff Sargent. All right, uh, an expanded quarantine corner over at the Football Analytics Show. Yeah. I'm at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. We had 
a League of Legends daily fantasy podcast this week. I thankfully did not give any analysis. I was just there to play point guard, um, but I was physically there. Uh, Brandon Gadula and Tom Vecchio know what they're talking about. So uh, insights for this weekend slate on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday all included there. Just search for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed to get that. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer. He's been busier than ever, weirdly, with without any sports going on. Everyone's going to Cal to get requests in. So, Cal, thank you for taking time to help us out here today, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in to this episode of Covering the Spread. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll talk to you again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 